this book has very specific place names that are hard to pronounce. Yes. Uh, has, it has <laughs> Arabic words from, um, from Islam in there. And so mm-hmm. I knew that that would be really challenging for a lot of people. And, and you can speak to this, particularly there's multiple characters that are not, you know, there's an American, there's an American yeah. interpreter, there's a yeah. Afghan warlord. There. So I think you did a great job differentiating all those obviously through acting exacting right um yeah it's, it's voice acting yeah right and um th- those were my main concerns i was like i hope i can find someone that can you know want to do this and then actually pull it off because i knew it was going to be hard the leader spoke into his icon commander zuba we got a guy here he says he knows the big one the radio warmed to life, and through the white noise, Zubair's voice cracked. What's his name? Torjan repeated his name, his father's name. Zubair responded. Does he have metal attached to his arm? Torjan rolled his sleeve and showed the leader the edge of the splint and screws from when he'd been wounded by an RPG several months ago. The same wound that brought him to the good American. Yes, Commander Zuba. Let that one go now. Don't bother him again. The leader leered at Torjan. You heard what he said. Down the dirt hill, faster and faster, Torjan raised his legs and spread them wide as the elation streamed off his back. The bike quickly became unbalanced on the chewed and broken road, and Torjan, with a sprint of his heart, jammed his feet onto the pegs. Out of sight, he stopped, took his cell phone from his sandal, and kissed the micro SD card, whispering, Alhamdulillah, before slipping the tiny card into his turban. How are you, Matt Creekio? First of all, did I say your name right? Said it right. Got it. It's a hard name. It's a, it's a very hard name. Because I know when we recorded the book and I sent you the, the first 15 minute sample and you came back to me and you went, you pronounced my name wrong. And I'm like, oh, no, <laughs> like the worst word ever to pronounce wrong in an audio book, the bloody author's name. <laughs> but uh, we got it right in the end. We got it right. The hardest right. part was trying to send you back a message of how to say it phonetically. <laughs> right. So I sat there. I sat there actually for a while and I was like, how do you I want to make sure I can convey like how to say this very difficult Italian name, but I think I got it. I mean, cause you hit it perfectly. Okay. Well, I'm glad I got it. Cricchio. Okay. I've got it. That's great. True. Okay. And you're in Virginia. Yes. Did you grow up there? I did grow up in Virginia. So because I, cause you know, obviously you've got the military service and, and military people tend to move around where the work is. So that's pretty handy that you ended up Grow living in a place where you grow up, even though you went through the military system. Yeah, so my dad was in the military, and he was stationed all around Virginia. So we've lived here my whole life, and I, I don't. It's kind of funny. I don't have the accent because both of my parents, my dad's from New York City, and my mom is from um, Boston. So uh, inside of our house, it was like the Northeast, but outside of our house, it was like the South. So I have, I have a weird. Um amalgamated accent so what does a virginian accent sound like mm, it's very um genteel southern okay all right so it's not twangy and like what we would call in america redneck ish it's just very uh soft and lilting that's how i would say it okay yeah. now we'll talk about your military service because it is appropriate to this book you served as an interrogator and a spy handler with special uh, operations forces in Afghanistan. How did. did you end up in that line of work? Well, that's a long story. Um, so I joined the Navy in 2007 and I wanted to um, be a Navy SEAL. So I trained very hard physically to go to the training. But when I got there, I, I broke my wrist. And so I was medically dropped from the training. Um, but I got lucky because often what happens in the American Navy is you have to do whatever job they tell you to do after that. So I had gone to school, I'd gone to college, graduated, wanted to be a Navy SEAL, and then I might end up, and this is no disrespect to anyone that did this, but you know, chipping paint off of a, the side of a, 
um, aircraft carrier. And I didn't want to do that, but I got lucky and there was openings for intelligence analysts. And so I, was, I jumped on it. And when you think of the Navy, you think of big gray ships and maybe some aircraft. And that was not really what I was interested in, but because at that time America was engaged obviously in conflict in Afghanistan and Iraq, they were opening up what they called ground intelligence. And you know, the funny name for it was the dirt Navy. So I got to be an intelligence analyst. So taking information, pro taking raw information and processing it into intelligence that people could actually use to um, conduct operations for the Navy SEAL teams. And another good thing that happened around that time is the Navy realized that, that they needed human intelligence. So they had, you know, um, we had airplanes with cameras and we had signals intelligence and we had other sorts of means of collecting intelligence, but they didn't have anyone that actually spotted, recruited human intelligence sources to provide information. Obviously that's going to be very vital in landlocked countries like Iraq and Afghanistan. And so we, I was one of the first couple of classes that got to go to the Marine Corps interrogator, uh, spy handler for, you know, uh, lack of a better term school, which was extremely difficult, had a, um, low graduation rate and I got through and I went back to supporting the SEAL teams and deployed to Afghanistan to do that job. So day to day, your job involved, what, working with the locals who were spying on behalf of the U.S.? Yeah, essentially. Uh, it, it sounds cooler than it was because it's actually just a lot of report writing. But yeah, um, you would you would basically cultivate relationships and through those relationships, you would gather information that was vital to us conducting operations. Um, and then when operations occurred and people were taken prisoner, it was my job to, this also sounds cooler than it is, extract information from them. And, I'm hearing interrogation here, yeah. Yeah, right. And, uh, you know, I guess I'm... Is it like the movies? No, it's really not. When... A good interrogation is based on actually establishing rapport with somebody. And the job essentially is the ability to establish rapport with people, to get people to trust you, obviously, but also to understand. And I think this is, I think this is why writing is really attractive to me. Understand why people do what they do mm -hmm. and then be able to help them either attain whatever their motivation is or deny them. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the pull of hunger is actually a story about a bad spy handler, American spy handler and a good oh, Afghan nice. who's trying to do whatever he can to provide for his family in this horrible chaotic mess. Yeah. Uh, for, I don't want to give away any spoilers, but uh, the motivation for the main character in this book is his child needs some quite urgent medical attention yep. and that, yep. that, that that's what's driving him. And so that's, th that's the, uh, the bargaining chip, I suppose that the, the American is playing to right. get him to do what he wants him to do and get the information he wants him to do. It's a fascinating book. So how much of this book then is based on your real experience? You know, it's a funny question because I think every, I think every piece of fiction, I mean, to even a fantasy like genre is, has something of the writer's life in it. So, but this one, because, you know, I was a spy handler, I was an interrogator with special operations forces in Afghanistan, maybe seems a little closer to real life, but I wouldn't say that these events are events that I experienced, but the, the emotion, the type of people that I met on both sides, quite honestly, um, Americans and Afghans, all of that is very true to the things I experienced. So I was very, and I think this made me different. I was very sympathetic to Afghans who wanted a, a better life, obviously. And um, I, I got trained by really good people. And one thing a mentor told me is we always come through on our promises. And so, you know, don't want to give away any spoilers, but if you promise someone that you can get the medical attention, you get them medical attention mm -hmm. and they're not, they're not your, they work for you. And that is the relationship. And that's explained very clearly as you go down the path of um, turning someone from basically a contact to an asset, but they're not your pawn. 
So you give them whatever it is you promised that you would give them to the best of your ability. If you can't, you explain truthfully why you can't and maybe what you're going to do instead. Mm -hmm. so, so there's a lot of trust uh, involved there. Yeah, and it's and it's funny because it's a game where no one can trust anybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But and when how... it's done right, when it's yeah. done right, it is based on it's based on trust, mutual respect, and you know, wanting the same things in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And how have the people who you served with reacted to the book? Uh, I think a lot of this book. I, have, I should say this. This book is a spinoff yeah. of a of a novel I wrote called Security Day. Yeah. That's why it says and, it's from the world of Security Day, doesn't right, it? Right. Yeah. Right. And this is sort of an alternate Torjan is in Security Day. Torjan is the main Afghan character in this book. And it's an alternate ending to what actually happens to Torjan in that book. And Security Day for the people that I served with, I think they were the ones that bought that book mostly. Uh, okay. there was really nothing but support. Um you know there is there is a little caution on some people's ends because in this world where everyone talks about what they did and who they knew and all the cool stuff, uh, there is a there is a group of people within special operations and intelligence that wants to go back to keeping those things private and not public. Yeah. So I did have many friends that they didn't realize that it was a fiction book. They thought it was a nonfiction book, and so <laughs> they once you're giving the game away, oh, <laughs> yeah, it's completely fictionalized, and you know I I don't. I don't give away, I don't tell anything that ever happened to any real people. Mm -hmm. um, after that was sort of cleared up, everyone was very supportive. And had you written anything before your military service? Was writing a thing you did as you enjoyed doing as a hobby and, and as a kid? Yes, I, I actually, funny enough, I joined the military because I was about to graduate from um, university, college, and I was working on Capitol Hill as an intern for a senator. And I had an English degree. I wanted to be a writer my whole life. And my my dad asked me what I was gonna do next. And he, you know, are you gonna continue? Are you gonna build a career in, um, you know, uh, government? And I was like, no, nah, I don't wanna do that. Cause I'd already seen things that I was like, I don't wanna be, I don't wanna be anywhere near this. And I said, I, I've wanted to be a writer my whole life, I wanna write. And he looked at me and he goes, how are you going to write anything when you haven't even lived a life? And I was like, man, he's right. And so, <laughs> and I don't recommend this to anyone. I actually think it was kind of dumb, but I joined the military to get experiences to write about. So this is something I always want to do. And I got out when I got out of the military, I went back to school. Uh, this is a big thing in America, not so much a big thing in the UK, but we have graduate school programs where you can get degrees in fiction writing. And so I got one of those as well. And the Pull of Hunger and Security Days were basically my thesis, my master's thesis from that program. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So it all came together nicely. So you had, you played quite a long game there as far as <laughs> becoming, long. wanting to be a writer. Yeah. So when you joined the military, did you have any idea that you'd end up really in the heat of it in, in Afghanistan? Or did you think, because you could get, you could have got stationed anywhere. I wanted to. So I, I did everything I could to get, I, I did everything I could to get to those places because I, I again, I joined for experiences and I, and yeah. it's not, not something I'd recommend to anyone else, but I wanted to, I wanted to be. And that was why the Navy to, SEALs were what appealed to you. Right. Right. And I, I wanted to be at the center of, uh, there's a line in, in security day that this is true to life. One of the characters, when someone's like, why are you even here doing this? And they say, I wanted to be a part of history. And like, that's the way I felt. I wanted to be a part of, of history and i you know it's ambitious and very um 20 year old thinking but th that's how i thought i know you're being modest but there must have been some element of it you wanted to serve your country as well right yeah 100 percent. okay yeah i just want to clear that up in case yeah. anybody thinks oh he joined the military because he wanted to be a better writer jeez i mean that's not why you know that that I can see would be one of them, but the, the, those kind of people don't make good Navy SEALs no, or good no, interrogators no. Uh, and uh, and spy handlers. So I just want to make that clear. And I absolutely. want to thank you for your service as well, your military I, I, service. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. And my whole family, my, my wife was in the Navy. My brother was a Marine. My dad was in the Navy. My brother-in-law was in the Navy. I mean, this is something kind of, it's a family tradition of sorts. So that that definitely played into it. 
And how have they liked the books? Uh, you know, my wife is my biggest fan. So she loves it and she recognizes she was on that same deployment. So she recognizes locations or she recognizes, you know, um, loosely based incidences. Uh, so she loves it. Um, family is very, family is very supportive of mm. this entire adventure. Yeah. I'm glad you said your wife's your biggest fan. Uh, it reminds me, it's a slightly off topic, but when it, when I was working in radio, I interviewed a, a musician called Gary Newman. I don't know if you've heard of him. He's a big star here. He had a, a hit with a, a, a single in the late 70s called Cars, and before that, he was with an outfit called Tube Army. And he married the the head of his fan club. And I asked him, I said, you, you married a fan? And he just said to me, doesn't everybody? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the greatest answers to an interview question I ever got when I was working in radio. Yeah, so you went to Virginia Commonwealth University, so that was after your military service to so, really hone your writing skills. Right, I got my I got my undergraduate degree there, and then I went back for my graduate degree. So, right, so that was either side of the military. Yes, I see. So that's that's really worked out well, and you got uh, you got the life experience in the middle there. And so, what difference did that make? Having because a lot of writers just just get on with it. Having that formal education. If you, you know, a lot of writers will be watching this. What would, who might be thinking, you know, do I need to, to learn how to do this? What did you actually get from the, the academic side of, of being taught how to write? That's actually a great question. And actually one I'm really passionate about and maybe not in the way you're going to expect. I think that, and, I, and a lot of people understand what I'm saying, especially people considering this. If you can go to a program for free, meaning you get a scholarship, or there's some other tuition assistance provided, I think it's actually a great experience. I don't think that you should go into debt for one of these degrees because I think one of the major problems is they don't necessarily they don't necessarily teach you how to be a professional writer. I was very lucky. I had a very good mentor. His name is Tom DeHaven, who taught me how to be professional. And so, you know, writing in your room once in a while and solely cranking out a novel is one thing but behaving and then producing like a professional writer is a totally different thing and so i think if you can do a lot of research on a program and there was a lot of emphasis in you know on their uh mission statement or in the their the literature they provide on becoming professional that that's a good idea but i think anything else you could through um practice and through dedication and i mean the internet is just it's rife with a lot of not good things but um it, it does have good information on how to professionalize yourself i think that you could do it on your own i just think probably that that time scale is a lot longer if you're doing it on your own mm -hmm. this is an incredibly well-written book and that obviously comes from your experience and you're supposed to write what you know but good writers are also readers as well what kind of stuff were you reading along the way that influenced you and, and gave you some ideas and inspiration? That's a great question. Uh, John Le Carre, number one, obviously. Wow. Spy who, thrills, who, yeah. Right, who to me is the master. And uh, let me take it back. He's the second master. Graham Greene is also, uh, to me, the epitome of a spy novel that also has dimensions of uh, emotionality and, and heart. I was lucky enough to narrate a Graham Greene. I, I narrated It's a Battlefield. Uh, wow. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, I did that with uh, with Tanta audiobooks, recorded books. It, it, recorded books are the uh, the biggest producer of audiobooks in the world. And uh, yeah. one of the, the companies that are part of that are Tanta Audio in uh, Connecticut, and I did it for them. Uh, I think it's the, it's the, the version that's available... In the UK is done by a British movie actor who you'll know, and I forget his name now, but, which is terrible. But I'm on the US version and in other territories as well. I, I did uh, that one. And, and yeah, I see what you mean about Le Carrier. Le Carrier I haven't actually read, but I've seen Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy and, and right. I'll know all the other things. But uh, Graham Greene, I can see that now from reading your book and reading his as well, especially in the way that things are described, um, getting the vibe of things, I thought, that you did really well. and Because I've never been to Afghanistan or in the military or in any kind of conflict whatsoever. But I really felt like I, 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 I it, for me, reading it out loud, I really felt like I, I got into it and uh, 
I could almost feel the heat and the dirt and how dry it was and dirty um, in places. Yeah. Uh, I really, good. really enjoyed reading. Like I say, it is a, a really, really well-written book, and it was a joy to read. For you, how was the experience of turning your work into an audio book? I didn't know what to expect. Um, you know, you put it out there and you get auditions and, and some are really good. Obviously yours was the best, but there were many around yours that I was like, well, it was pretty good. Then you get some really bad ones. And, uh, you know, that part is daunting. And then, and you could speak to this specifically, this book has very specific place names that are hard to pronounce. Yes. Uh, as it has <laughs> Arabic words from, um, from Islam in there. And so mm -hmm. I knew that that would be really challenging for a lot of people. And, and you can speak to this particularly, there's multiple characters that are not, you know, there's an American, there's an American yeah. interpreter, there's a yeah. Afghan warlord there. So I think you did a great job differentiating all those, obviously through acting, you could say acting, right? Um, yeah, it's, it's voice acting. Yeah. Right. And, um, Th those were my main concerns. I was like, I hope I can find someone that can, you know, want to do this and then actually pull it off. Because I knew it was going to be hard. Yeah, it, it wasn't that hard because they were well written and the characters jumped off the screen. I was going to say off the page, but I do it off a screen, so I'll say it's off a screen. And um, differentiating the characters is, is really the whole key to a book like yours. Because um, in a book... Your eyes will read the dialogue, and then afterwards it'll be said, and then it'll have the character's name. Right. But you, but in an audio book, you've also you've you've got to kind of read ahead to find out who's saying it, and then say it in that voice, and make the voice consistent for that character the whole way through, so that when the listener hears that voice, they don't have to wait to hear at the end where it says what the character was that was was talking was saying the dialogue so and it was quite it was quite easy i mean i had a few different goes at the different characters until i was comfortable with each and i have a file a uh, google drive file where i put audio of a few lines of each of the different characters so that when a character comes up again because sometimes they're in a book they can leave a book for a long time for a couple of chapters and then come back and you've got to get them spot on again yeah. and so i do that and i have them and i just go back i take the character's name and I listen to it again, and then I listen to it again, and then I go, okay, I got it. And then I read what they're saying and then get into it. But it was a very, very enjoyable book to do. I mean, it's, you know, parts of it are quite dark, but it, I, so it sounds kind of scary to say I enjoyed that. But it was it was just the right amount of challenge for me. And I, uh, I, really, I really did get into it. And uh, I was actually quite, um, I was quite disappointed when it ended. And I thought, oh, you know. I haven't got that one to work on anymore because I work on multiple books at a, at, a, at a time. So like I'll do a chapter of your book in the morning and then uh, mid morning I'll do a chapter of somebody else's and then early afternoon after lunch I'll do, you know, and I'll, I'll work on the most, the most I've worked on at any one time, which was too many, was 12. But I usually work on around about six to eight and, uh, and on each day I'll get to three or four of the six to eight and, and, and work my way through. And it's always when there's a one that's a really, really good story like yours, it's always like, oh, great, I'm going to do Matt's one next. You know what I mean? You know, have lunch and you think, oh, I've got Matt's one after lunch or, or whatever it is. You know, you can look forward to it. So I was there was, there was a little piece of my because I, I love this work. And uh, there was a, just a little piece. Once it was all over, it was just a little, little bit like, oh, I haven't got that one to work on anymore. But uh, it was good. Really, really good. I, I appreciate that. That's high so praise. This, That's no, it's, it, it's really, really well written book. Really, really good. And, and I understand why now. Because I had no idea when I was reading it what your background was. In fact, I only I, I did some research on you this morning. It was this line. I'm like, oh, wow, he's the real deal. And then I'm like, well of, well, of course he is. That's why it was so well written. Yeah, but it's interesting that you also got the training in it as well and the education in, in writing too, as well as just, you know, um, making it like an, an expanded fictional memoir kind of thing, which it isn't. It is a proper spy thriller. It is a proper uh, fiction book. And this is, uh, this is the, the short one, the, the Pull of Hunger, the novella. So mm -hmm. then the, the novel, Security Day, any plans to turn that into an audio book? There are plans in the works. I, I know a good narrator now, so 
<laughs> well, don't let me force your arm. You you can go out and audition, and you got to get the exactly the right person because I don't know. You know, I speak to many many authors of of the books I've done, and I don't know how they have the faith to take all that work and so much of their life that's gone into a book and just hand it over to someone they've never met on the other side of the Atlantic and go, go on, do your best. That is a leap of faith for me. I, I don't know how you do it. Yeah. It's like sending your kid to the first day of school. <laughs> I bet that's it, what it feels like. I bet it does. I bet it does. So what's next for Matt Cricchio? Uh I have a book coming out in April. Yes. It's a crime thriller. Yeah. Called Day of Wrath. Right. And um, it, it'll be on my website, mattcricchio.com, and then um, anywhere where you buy books. And so that is what's coming up. It's, uh, it's funny. You know, Security Day has a um, – based on a true story. This also is based on a true story, and it's about a um, – it's about a woman who gets robbed at gunpoint in an alley – but she's pretty sure that she's pretty sure that they, um, man, I don't want to give too much away. I'm trying to think out of, don't give this. too much away. I, she's pretty sure that there might be an international spy organization behind this. Nice. Nice. So it's got a real other level to it. It's not just mm -hmm. about crime. It's got a whole level to it. And you can deep oh, yeah. dive into that. <laughs> right. So the website is com. I'll put a link. If you're watching this on YouTube, I'll put a link in the description. I'll also put a link to where you can get The Pull of Hunger on Amazon as an audio book. You'll be able to uh, download it from there. Matt Cricchio, it's been a pleasure talking to you and uh, continued success. Just a great book. It's The Pull of Hunger. It's a spy thriller novella from the world of Security Day by Matt Cricchio.